welcome to church in a really lovely, lovely day, very rare. <laughs> now, I have two announcement, announcements. Um, I don't know if you knew, but Mrs. Pickles died, and her funeral's on Friday, and it's going to be cold streamed, and Rosemary hopes to have the contact by then. <laughs> and I'd like to welcome Anne Stewart again to give us our service. Morning, everyone. Good morning. It's lovely to be here with you again. Thank you for having me. In Psalm 34, we read the words which are our call to worship today. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the person who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Let's worship God singing our first song, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. moving in this place. Almighty God, you are present here with us. You who made everything there is, the whole universe, everybody who has ever been, all the beautiful nature and countryside that we're surrounded by. You who made the laws of physics, who knows every hair in our heads, you are present here. Help us to be still and know that. So often when we come to pray, we ask you to be with us. But you are always with us. There is nowhere we could go to get away from you. You are everywhere. But sometimes through our own behaviour, you are absent to us because of our sin. And so we ask you to forgive us 
whether for the first time or the thousandth time, for the things that have kept us from a close walk with you. In the past, recently, even today, forgive us and cleanse us and renew us and restore us and help us to be more like Jesus, We thank you for this opportunity to be together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we thank you that we are part of your church worldwide, that there are thousands of people, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people worshipping you today. And we're all part of your family. And we thank you for the saints who have gone before us as well, including Hazel. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for this time together and we ask you to speak into our hearts through this service. Help us to hear and obey and enjoy your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've got a slide here, next one, Cara, thanks. Um, which is not just aimed at the young folk here, you're too old for these toys anyway, I know that, but um, for all of us, a question, um, what these toys, children's toys, might have in common. Some of them you might have had a version of when you were a child looking around, I know that some of you did not have a version, a toy mobile phone when you were a child, I just know that. Uh, but. Um, you may have had other toys of that ilk, not exactly the same. Can you think of a theme that these toys have in common? You too shy. They're all plastic. Yeah, they're all plastic, <laughs> that's true. Uh, what did you say? You, they are, yes, you're getting there. Well, they're toys, they're not strictly useful, but they're, they're yes, they are toys that represent something useful, you're getting there. Exactly, yes. They copy what adults can do. And uh, a lot of children's toys, when you look at them, maybe some of the ones you had when you were wee, um, are about pretending to be grown up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The young lady who answered that question along the road this morning said, <laughs> which was so wise, there are toys that you play with when you're a child because you want to be a grown up, and then when you're grown up, you realise they're not. <laughs> It's not that much fun, which is very wise and very true, isn't it? Um, yeah. When you finally get to do your own hoovering or ironing or cutting the grass, maybe not so much. Do you know, when I was a child, I used to awful look forward to going to a meeting. I had no idea what a meeting was, but I thought it must be wonderful to go to a meeting. And I've kind of changed my mind about that, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> But so a lot of children's, not all children's toys, but a lot of children's toys are giving kids the opportunity to pretend to be the adults that they see in their life. And um, uh, role play and uh, fantasy play is a big part of being a child. And it may be they're just like these toys, they might be just copying things that they see the adults in their own lives doing. So they may have seen somebody hoovering in the house or cutting the grass or ironing. Um, and so they're copying. Our kids used to have long conversations on their plastic phones when they were babies, before they could even talk. It wasn't actual words, you know, <laughs> babbling into the phone. Um, uh, and that's normal children's play. So is, I guess, uh, pretending to be superheroes or, um, you know, a lot of children's dress-up clothes, pretending to be a doctor, pretending to be a, a fireman or a policeman or whatever police person, police officer, that's the word um, So a lot, of, a lot of children's toys are about pretending to be uh, a, an adult. When our firstborn, who'll be 30 next year, was we, my mother-in-law gave her a kind of toy hoover thing, a wee bit like that one at the top, not exactly the same, and it was so loud, honestly. It was so loud. And I don't know whether she's done that on purpose. <laughs> Surely not, surely not. But anyway, I eventually said to my mother-in-law, do you know, I always think it'd be good if Hannah had two or three toys at your house to play with, so um, I'm bringing this to your house. 
because it was so noisy. But anyway, she let Hannah loved that and going about pretending to Hoover. Because in our family, I don't really do much hoovering because my husband loves hoovering. And the kids always called it Daddy's Hoover, and that suited me just fine. So, but that's the theme of those stories. And that's just an introduction to, next slide please, the theme for the service today, and the, it's in the Bible reading. If you listen carefully, you'll hear these two words in the Bible reading, is that we are invited, all of us, whether you're young, old, whatever age you are, we are invited, encouraged, asked to be imitators of God be imitators of God. I don't think God has leather shoes like that, but if we were trying to, um, you know, we have this saying about big shoes to fill, God's shoes would be very big to fill indeed, but we are invited to be imitators of God. Just like children copy adults, we are invited to copy God, and the role model we have to do that is Jesus, and we're going to be looking at that in the service today, but before that we're going to have uh, another hymn which is Father I place into your hands which I always think is just a lovely prayer just giving all your all your troubles and thoughts to God but the last verse is really about um, us kind of copying God and that's why we're having that today so Father I place into your hands <laughs> Psalm 130. Thank you. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. And we continue our readings from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to chapter 5, verse 2. 
Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbour, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Amen, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Thank you very much. Now we're going to sing him 89 in Mission Praise, Come Down, O Love Divine. such a great hymn and it's it's old now and maybe it's a bit less accessible for our modern generation because of some of the language in it but um, 
I forgot to prepare any homework for the sermon part of the service. So your homework, because I know you always look forward to the homework that I give you, is if you want to, to uh, if you've got an old hymn book at home or you've got access to the internet, Google will oh, come down, oh, what's the first line, come down, oh love divine, and just enjoy it over the week as a, a poem, because um, it's so meaty, there's so much in it, uh, it's worth the, the time to study it. When I was at university, in the whole five years, we got one lecture on hymns, and it was it was a good lecture. It was from um, John Bell, who knows what he's talking about with music, and has written some hymns. But his, his point was that the difference between a hymn and a poem is that a hymn needs to be understandable while you're singing it. Whereas a poem, you can look at it for a while and think about it, but you need to be able to understand the words as you're singing them in order to mean them as a, an act of worship to God, which makes sense. Um, and maybe that him um, sliding into the realms of a poem now for, for the modern generation. But the basic summary of it is just an invitation to God's Holy Spirit into our lives. There's a, a modern hymn that uses the line, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here, which is lovely. And I sometimes, when my brain's like spaghetti, which is quite a lot of the time, my brain's often like spaghetti, um, I use that as a kind of prayer, just asking that God would speak to me um, when my brain's too confused to speak to him. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And you could say that's a summary of that hymn, but your homework, study at your leisure and for your enjoyment. Um, Come down, O oh love divine, as a poem. But I never take in the homework. I never ask you if you've done it. You're fine if you haven't done it. Sorry, right. nothing bad will happen if you haven't done it. Um, so yes, our theme today is be imitators, which comes straight from that uh, reading that that we had, and uh, we're going to be looking at that. And the reason that that's the theme, the reason that those were the readings, is that. Um, as you may or may not know, some of you will know well, the Church of Scotland has on its website um, a, a bit for ministers mainly and congregations to access called Weekly Worship, and it gives you some suggestions for each week. And they're based on a thing called the Revised Common Lectionary, which some of you may, or may have heard of, some of you wouldn't have heard of possibly and it doesn't matter whether you've heard of it or not. It's a kind of diary with readings for different Sundays in the year. Um, and some church traditions, uh, some church de denominations, very, very rigorously follow the lectionary so that in those denominations, any church that you went to on a Sunday would be studying the same bit of the Bible. Um, the Roman Catholic Church typically does that. Uh, some denominations wouldn't have heard of the lectionary. It's not part of their life at all. And as in so many other things, the Church of Scotland's in the middle. <laughs> and it's kind of up to the individual ministers and congregations whether they follow the lectionary or not. There's no um, rule that says that you must. But when you're going, like I am today, to a congregation, you don't know what they've been working through, what they're looking at, uh, and you're confronted with the entire Bible to choose a passage from, going to the lectionary is a good idea because <laughs> it gives you a, a structure. And when I did that this week, when I went to the weekly worship page in the Church of Scotland website um, to see what the lectionary readings were, I was kind of amazed, to be honest. I was astonished because that Ephesians 1 in particular was so relevant to the week that we've just been observing on the news with all the tensions, particularly in England, other parts of the UK, um, and protests and fighting in the street and uh, dissent and um, trouble. And not only is that the reading for today, but the notes that accompany the reading on the Church of Scotland website, which again are optional, you can look at them or not look at them as suits you, but the notes for today were prepared by a lady who you may have heard of called Carolyn Merry, and she's director of Place for Hope, which is a Christian organisation that deals with conflict resolution. And those notes would have been prepared a long time ago, and the lectionary readings were picked an even longer time ago, but there they were, absolutely, it seemed to me, appropriate for 
a week in which we've seen a lot of troubles on the screen on our news. Um, for all I know, some of you were down writing in England as well. No, I don't think that's true. <laughs> but we've certainly seen them on the, the news. And the world is troubled. There's no question about that. The world's always been troubled. Um, even the oldest among you haven't had, you know, even a 10-minute period in your life when there wasn't troubles in the world. Uh, there's always been troubles. And maybe it's no worse than it ever was. Or maybe it is worse. Maybe it's better. And I would love, I was tempted actually to, just to get you to put your hand up if you thought the world was worse today than it used to be or if you think the world's better today than it used to be or if you think the world's just the same as it used to be but I've decided not to do that I'm not going to put you in the spot but you can tell me afterwards if you want to um, is the world getting worse or better or is it just the same um, and probably the answer is complicated probably it's better some things are better for some people and some things are worse for some people um, it's probably complicated and even good advances can bring them with sometimes bring with them unforeseen negative consequences so even good things can can have a downside and but in this past week certainly we've seen unrest in some british cities and looked into some very angry faces on our news screens um, not all angry about the same thing and angry sometimes from opposite points of view but angry some of the faces, I have to say, not so much angry. I've seen one or two photos of folk full of glee carrying stuff they've just looted from a shop and smiling all over their faces. <laughs> um, but in general, there's been a lot of strongly held feelings on, not on two sides, on a variety of sides. And um, we've seen that on the news. And of course, it's not just the turmoil in England and other bits of the UK. There's been, we're aware of the ill feeling that there currently is in America um, between the supporters of the, some of the supporters of the two main political parties in America, because that's reported uh, quite widely in the UK. There's been controversy about some things in the Olympics. Um, and some of all that disagreement is absolutely bathed in hate. Not all of it, some of it's just honest discussion and disagreement, but some of it is bathed in hate and uh, not just disagreement but hate and there's this polarised thing going on between right and left which slightly bothers me because I don't know if I'm right or left because there's bits of right I agree with and bits of and I don't want to be one or the other I don't want to be polarised into one another but the world seems to be heading in that direction that's on the news that's a, a national, international level but, but closer to home some of us may have conflicts going on. Lots of families, many of our own families have fallouts sometimes and disagreements and some of these may be very serious, may be very long lasting and relationships can break down altogether uh, all too easily unfortunately because we're human beings and we're prone to that, to disagreement. I had a, my gran had maternal grandmother had two brothers whose wives, who were sisters-in-law of one another, didn't speak for 60 or 70 years, died in their 90s. Nobody knew what, what it was about, but they, <laughs> all these years didn't speak. Their brothers, um, their husbands, who were brothers of one another, did speak. They were farmers. They would see each other at the market and they would chat away and whatever. The, their children, my mum's generation, um, when they became adults, all made friends, they still see each other, they're still friends. But these two ladies had some kind of fallout, nobody knew what it was about, it lasted 60 or 70 years until presumably the first one of them died. Um, and lots of families have got those kind of things. When I was a child, I thought it was hilarious. It's not hilarious, it's sad. It's not hilarious. Uh, and lots of families have these things, um, don't they? But guess what? The Bible, as always, has things to say to help us today. The Bible is such a faithful guide, isn't it, um, for life in general? And I don't think there'll be any emotion that any of us have experienced or could come up with that we can't read about 
on the pages of the Bible. People in the Bible had all the same emotions and situations um, that we have today. I work, as most of you know, as a prison chaplain, and most of my time, I'm full time, most of my time is at Castle Huntley Men's Prison. But I also work a couple of hours a week at Bella, which is a women's unit in Dundee, um, quite small, very small in fact. But on Wednesday there, we started a Bible study group, and there was five ladies came along. It was really, they were so open and engaged, it was great. But what we did at that uh, first meeting was, um, I was explaining them to them that in the Bible, there's lots of stuff to do with what we now regard as modern terms about wellness and mental health and well-being and all that kind of thing. And that, that's how we were going to come be approaching uh, the Bible study. And uh, we're not going to call it a Bible study because that's too off-putting a term. We're calling it Circle of Hope, which seemed a nice phrase. Um, but so we, we, we had a list of negative things, emotions, states, feelings that we can have, things that we can be. And at the top of the list was shame. And I deliberately put that at the top of the list because many female prisoners feel shame not just about things that they've done, but things that were done to them. And they, they shouldn't feel shame about those things, but they do. Uh, and lots of other things about bitterness and um, lack of hope and all the kind of things that we can... All negative things, being in a dark place, all these phrases. Big long list, a whole page of things. And then I had another page, and that was all positive things. Um, like love and joy and hope and peace and um, nice things, a whole page of them as well. And we were talking about how all these negative things, you can find people in the Bible who were going through those things. In fact, you can actually find people in the Bible who were causing those things in other people. Um, because the Bible's full of stories, as you know, about human beings and human frailty. Not one person other than Jesus in the Bible was perfect. So all these negative things are in the Bible, but also in the Bible's all this positive stuff and advice about how we can have that positive thing and, and who to go to, God, in other words, for love and joy and peace and hope and things that we all, every last one of us, I've never met anyone who said, I don't want those things. Of course we do. We all crave those things, happiness. And uh, in the Bible consistently in all that life throws at us both good and bad the bible points us to jesus it always always points us to jesus and in a nutshell we have to be imitators of god copying the example like children do with adults to, uh, toys that are versions of adults activities that we we're looking at earlier we're to be copying the example of jesus when he was on earth what does that mean, though? What does that look like? Well, Carol and Mary, this lady from A Place for Hope uh, organisation, bearing in mind it's her full-time job working with conflict resolution, she says, in times of conflict and change, there are always moments in which we must choose. Do we react out of fear or do we respond out of love? The fate of relationships, communities... Indeed, lives of whole populations can be determined by how we choose. Sometimes those moments pass so quickly, we barely know we have a choice. We react without pausing, without thinking sometimes, without truly choosing. And isn't that the case? And her organisation, the Place for Hope organisation, helps people, both individuals and also congregations and other groups, to be peacemakers who can navigate conflict well. And they say that they want every community, so that would include this congregation, every community, to be a place for hope and reconciliation where all are able to, and listen to this list, it's so great, all are able, all of us are able to notice brokenness and division, nurture relationships and community, navigate conflict with graciousness, nourish wholeness in themselves and their communities. <coughs> so that's what that organisation hopes that we can be able to do. I'm going to read it again, it's such a good list. Notice brokenness and division. That involves proper listening, because proper listening is quite hard, isn't it? We're often champing at the bit to say what we want to say. We're not really listening. And some of these people that are angry, that we've been seeing on the news, 
maybe feel that nobody is listening to them and might, that might be part of the problem. Notice brokenness and division. Nurture relationships and community. That means get folk together. Much easier to be friends with people once you know them. Much easier to be enemies with people that you've never met and you just have decided that you don't like them, you don't know them. Um, a number of years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Ghana with six Church of Scotland people, six including me, and six Muslim people from Scotland as well. And we were in Ghana for 10 days and we traveled around and we met religious leaders and some political leaders in Ghana because Ghana, as you may know, have made a big effort as a country to promote um, harmony between faith groups, different religions in their country. Some other African countries, that's not so true and there's tension and even fighting. Um, but in Ghana, they've made a big effort to have promote good relationships between the faith communities. In fact, while we were there, we met the senior imam, the chief imam of Ghana, who had just had his 100th birthday and he'd had his party in the Roman Catholic Cathedral because he was great pals with the bishop and the cathedral was a big space and they'd had the party in there. So they were actually friends and that, that is a role model for the people and they see that. And they, so we were there, we were told before we went to meet these people and learn from them. What became very clear to me during the week, um, I was on to them by the end of it, was they had realised this is a Church of Scotland and uh, Islamic um, joint enterprise, they had realised that if you put people together, as the 10 of us were, travelling around, uh, 12 of us travelling around for 10 days, living with each other, we would learn as much from one another as we would from the people that we met, which of course was absolutely true. And it was such a privilege. And um, I did some world religions at university, but I learned far more, obviously, just spending that time with these uh, Muslim um, Scots and uh, chatting to them and finding out about their culture and their life. And so, yes, uh, get folk together, nurture relationships and community. We know that. That's on a big scale, but that's also true if in a playground if two kids are arguing with each other and a playground supervisor gets them together because they're more likely to achieve a resolution if they talk to one another. Navigate conflict with graciousness. Grace is the thing that's supposed to be the this mark that runs through every one of us as a Christian. We have this theology of grace. Other people are not obliged to have that. They might be gracious. Christians are obliged to have a theology of grace because we've been forgiven for our sin and we are told that as a result we are meant to forgive other people. We're not to treat people as they deserve necessarily we have to treat them with love and grace and um, so we navigate conflict with graciousness or we're meant to, we don't always, but we're meant to. Nourish wholeness in themselves and in their communities. Holistic is a word that's become very rightly so, very popular nowadays in, in treatment, holistic treatment, but it comes straight from, straight from scripture, I believe, because God's all about our whole flourishing, all of us, um, and uh, wholeness is, is what God wants for us, actually. The world would be such a nice place if we did all that, if we had all those things, wouldn't it? But a lot of the time, that is not so much the reality, is it? It's not the reality. And this week, we've seen scenes on the news of open hostility where none of these things have been happening at all. Some of the those involved are now in prison. Um, obviously, with a prison... Uh, focus. I notice these things, but in the preceding week, so I work for the Scottish Prison Service, but the English Prison Service not so very different. The preceding week they've been talking about how they need to let out a lot of prisoners early because the jails are overcrowded. Um, and then suddenly, lo and behold, um, they were able to have instant trials, which doesn't normally happen, and put more people in prison. But uh, And it, Scotland's no different. We, we have Currently, out of about 8,000 prisoners, a quarter of them haven't had a trial. They're on remand because there's a big backlog through the COVID in the courts. Um, and England was the same. But lo and behold, they suddenly were able to have a uh, court in a hurry um, for these individuals. Uh, so, 
So what does our Bible reading then say about all of this? What does our reading today, particularly the one in Ephesians, um, is the one we're mainly going to be looking at? (coughs) It starts with therefore. So when you see a therefore, you always look to see what it's there for, what's the context. The context is Paul's just been talking about how if we become believers, we have to leave the old life behind in our old ways and we have to embrace our new life in Christ and follow the new ways and be imitators. That's what we have to, to do. And uh, So verse 25, I'm just going to run through them extremely quickly. Verse 25 tells us we must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to our neighbours, for we're all members of one body. So that's dealing with telling lies and dishonesty generally. Um, we have not to... We've not, lies come so easily to our tongues, especially to get us out of trouble, of course. Um, also sometimes because we want to win the approval of the people in the room um, we may say things we don't even believe in order to you know, fit in with, with people but we're told as, as believers we have to get rid of lie, all lies not to tell lies and uh, sometimes it's not even that we've told a lie verbally but it's that we've sat quietly while lies were being told and we haven't said anything um, because it says that we've also to speak truthfully to our neighbours. So we have to speak truth, um, and sometimes we don't. We just say nothing. So we have to get rid of telling lies. We have to get rid of anger. Well, certain responses to anger. Verse 26 says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. In your anger, do not sin. So in prison world, it won't surprise you to learn, I meet lots of people who have let their anger get the better of them, and that's why they're in jail. Um, Being angry is not itself sinful, but it says, in your anger, so you are going to get angry, in your anger, do not sin. Anger can be an absolutely right response to injustice, but in your anger, do not sin. And it's so easy to let anger boil over. So... The guys I work with at Cass Huntley, some of them have let their anger boil over into violence. That's why they're in prison. Um, I'm not really tempted to be violent. This doesn't come out, it's not on my radar. And I'm thankful, thankful that I'm not tempted in that way. But, we, but anger can boil over in other ways and it can, it can evolve into bitterness and uh, other unhealthy um, behaviours and emotions. And so it's not just that you get so angry, you punch somebody. You could also be so angry that you break off contact or you spread rumours or you whatever. There's other ways that we can respond to anger which are also sinful. And we're told, no, in your anger, do not sin. You will get angry, but in your anger, do not sin. And that's not always easy, but that's what we're told. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. So when I'm doing a wedding... Um, I always say to the couple, you know, don't, don't go to bed in an argument. Don't let the sun go, I quote this verse, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And I explain to them that in Scotland, in December, you have to make friends by half past three because it's just about to get dark. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the summer, you can be angry for longer, but in the winter. <laughs> uh, but it's good advice, isn't it? Many of us have, have known that advice in our lives. Um, Make, make friends on the day. Don't let this... Because it'll just get worse, won't it? It'll just get worse. Um, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. And that's why we've not to let anger get the better of us. Do not give the devil a foothold in your life, in your family, in your congregation, in your community, at your work, anywhere. Don't, don't you be the one, through your anger that gives the devil a foothold in any of these situations, any of these places. That's not where you want to be. That's not what you want. You want to be an imitator (coughs) of God. And then verse 20, it's about stealing. Um, He who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Some of you may never have done, like, major stealing, like shoplifting or something, but... um, Lots of people are stealing in other ways, aren't they? And, and maybe not telling the whole truth to the tax people or maybe not um, maybe skiving in their employer's time. I sometimes do that. 
not stealing my employer's time, I shouldn't be doing that. Um, so we've not to steal. And uh, then verse 29 is what comes out of our mouth. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. So that would include unwholesome talk conjures up the idea of you know, bad language and rude jokes, but it's also talking about gossip because that's unwholesome, that doesn't build anybody up. Um, so we have to take control of that. And not just with one another in the same room, but online as well. And uh, social media can be very, very toxic. I spend, I'm thinking of coming off, I spend quite a lot of time on Twitter, but it can be a very, very toxic place. And people are not building one another up. They're, they're being absolutely cruel to each other, horrible to one another. When I was a child, my father used to say, when my brother and I were arguing, is it kind, is it true, is it necessary? And I'm sure I see some people nodding, you must have had that said to you as well. I don't know where it originally came from, but is it kind, is it true, is it necessary? And I didn't like when he said that because I knew fine that what I was desperately wanting to say to my brother it's probably not any of those three things. <laughs> and uh, what a difference it would make. What, what a nice place the world would be if we were always saying only what is building others up so that it would benefit those who listen. What a difference that would make. And then nearly at the end of that chapter, verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Basically, to disobey God's word on purpose and behave in ways which mean that the Holy Spirit can't do the work in us that the Holy Spirit wants to do is what grieves the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to, to make us flourish, to give us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But if we shut the Holy Spirit out of our lives, the Holy Spirit is grieved. We can stop the fruit happening, and that grieves the Holy Spirit. And what does it say about our relationship with the Holy Spirit? This wonderful thing. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Isn't that amazing? You were sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. And if God seals something, then nobody's unsealing that, are they? And then to verse 31, which made makes us think of what we've seen in the television. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling, that's a lovely word, I like the word brawling, brawling and slander, it's not a lovely thing, but it's a good word, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Bitterness, rage and anger aren't good for us, they're not good for the people that we feel those things towards, and neither is slander and neither is malice. And the world is full of those things, and the internet is full of those things. But if we belong to Jesus, we have to have nothing to do with it. That's not to be what we are like. We have to be imitators of God without all those things in our life. Instead, what are we to be? Verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And Jesus is so hard on that. He says, if we don't forgive other people, we can't expect to be forgiven by God. It's very black and white in um, what Jesus says. We have to be kind and compassionate to one another. And families and churches and communities would be great in workplaces if everybody was always kind and compassionate to each other. And that's not necessarily the case, is it? Um, but we have to be. We have to be imitators of God. And we have to forgive one another. And sometimes that's hard. But with God's help, it is not impossible. It's possible with God's help. And then all of that summed up in this verse that's our theme today in chapter 5, verse 1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It seems like an kind of ludicrous thing that we should be asked to be imitators of God. I mean, we're just us. How could we be imitators of God? But you don't need to get very far into the Bible. In fact, it's on page two in Genesis chapter one, where it tells us 
that we were all made in the image of God and so being imitators of God is not a ludicrous idea because we were made to be like him and when we're not like him and when we're living that other way with all the hate and all that stuff we're not as we're meant to be we're not flourishing we're not actually happy we're certainly not making folk round about us happy but we were made to be in the, we were made in God's image and we were made to flourish when we imitate him. Just like kids copying their parents, we come with the same humble, or we should, same humble, open trust as a child and we copy what we see in Jesus. We copy his example, we imitate him, we are imitators. And people who don't know Jesus yet, will then see him in us if we're doing that. And perhaps they'll imitate us. You know, there are people making squillions of pounds on TikTok and YouTube and so on being influencers. We're not going to make any money doing this. But let's be influencers in the world that we engage with through the week. Not because we are so super special that anybody would copy us. We're not but because we've been influenced and are being influenced ourselves and are consciously imitating and copying the greatest influencer of all time, who is Jesus. And what's the key thing that we find in God that we should imitate? One word, love. That lady Carolyn Mary says, how do we move ourselves beyond our family, tribal, national allegiances and see all human beings as kin as part of ourselves. God who loves us, loves everyone with the same extravagant, unconditional and unending love. How do we love like God? Surely this is the question that must be answered if we are to turn things around from the violence, injustice, division and fear that our global systems and lives are currently rooted in and instead live as God intended to, uh, us to, as one rooted in love. And then she says, this love though isn't a soft wishy-washy type of love that accepts all behaviour or injustice at large. Rather, it's a strong proactive love that speaks and acts with unarmed truth with regard to violence, injustice and greed, but still shows disarming love to the person themselves. Some may see these words as naive in the world in which we live, but the world's hope now is in the lives embodying that sort of God's love, just as it was 2,000 years ago. Jesus' words back then might have been considered naive, but in fact, they were seen for what they actually were, dangerous. Dangerous to the status quo of violence, fear and division of those in power then as they are now. When our child was, or one of our children was, Two, she got stuck at the top of a climbing frame that she shouldn't have been on, but her mother wasn't paying proper attention. And she shouted from the top of the climbing frame, Mummy, I dangerous. <laughs> and it, it became a say, it's still a saying in our family if somebody's going out saying, oh, don't you be dangerous. And, uh, <laughs> um, but we're asked to go and be dangerous. We have to have that love that Jesus demonstrated. And it was a dangerous love. And we have to go and be dangerous loving dangerously, imitating God as we go from here and into the week ahead. Not through our um, positive thinking or our own efforts, but by Holy Spirit, you are welcome here, God changing us and making us loving as he is. Amen. And before we have our final hymn, we're going to have our prayer um, for others. I'm assuming somebody's going to see you. You again. <laughs> <coughs> Let us join together in prayer. O God, who is always with us, we thank you for your constant love and guidance, for all the gifts you gave us, the beautiful countryside, the productive gardens and fields, and the amazing wildlife and wonderful landscapes, the senses to see, smell, hear, taste and touch all the wondrous things around us. Give us the patience to be still and feel your goodness and encouragement flow over us. Let us be humble in knowing to bring our problems to you rather than striving to be independent. 
O God with us, we pray for our world, so in need of peace, healing and reconciliation, that your presence brings. May we each have the courage to be people of hope in these troubled times. May we walk into conflict. May we walk into fear. May we walk into despair. May we walk into the unknown and bring your spirit of peace, hope and love. O God with us, we pray for all in leadership, in our church, in our country and across the world. May our leaders keep their eyes on Jesus and through him increase their compassion, wisdom and love. May they use their power for the good of all, particularly those in the margins for whom Jesus had a special love. Help them to be mindful of the well-being and restoration of this planet. O God with us, we pray today for all in our congregation and community who are ill, who are afraid, who are in despair or who are in need of comfort. May the daily nourishment of Jesus, his peace and reconciliation be experienced in every life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us say together whichever version of our Lord's Prayer that you prefer. Our Father in heaven, may your name be good. I was once in the church in Jerusalem. It was a great privilege to be there, and they invited us all to say it was very international, the congregation, and all to say the Lord's Prayer in our own language, and it was just so lovely. It was a bit like that. <laughs> yeah. Right, our final hymn today is The Church is Wherever God's People Are Praising. <laughs> May the blessing and love of God the Father, his Son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit be with all of you and with those whom you love today and always. Mm -hmm.